Now let's move on to the, our uh, last speaker, Professor Shari Kagan. Okay. Could you share your slide? Okay, so um, uh, Professor Shari Kagan uh, uh, from uh, UPenn, and the talk title is Designing Optical Metamaterials from Colloidal Novel Metal Nanocrystal Assemblies. Okay, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Kagan. Thank you very much, and I, uh, I like Ray, I'm a morning person. So. <laughs> you had the last speaker, sorry. <laughs> you have it worse than I do then. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a you can feel bad for me when you go to sleep now. <laughs> anyway, I also wanted to, again, thank you, Ildu. It's really a great pleasure to get to participate uh, in this symposium and, um, and get to share some of the you know, things that we think about in nanoscale science and as participants, of course, as editors of ACS Nano, it's a great group to get to work with. And uh, so I thought maybe I would, uh, I, I chose a topic. So I decided that I would talk today about metal nanocrystals and um, uh, kind of where Ray pick, uh, leaves off, we almost pick up. Uh, and so while we we're also interested in semiconductors today, I thought I would tell you a little bit of, of a story in thinking about how we use uh, metal nanoparticles as building blocks of assemblies, uh, but in particular, uh, starting to make a little bit more of that effort, uh, connection uh, to their controlling their physical properties, a little bit through chemistry in the solid state in terms of after they're synthesized and deposited. And then in thinking about what we can do with them, what makes nanoparticles uh, a little bit unique either in their properties or in the way that we can uh, control and use them in fabrication in a way, in a way to build devices. And so uh, today, in particular, I'll, I'll focus on the examples of their use in optical metamaterials. And of course, I'll thank my students who you see uh, here. This is where we got to take our masks off for the first time in a group photo, uh, as well as the Office of Naval uh, Research, who really supported um, uh, the work that, I, that I'll describe. And of course, many of the collaborators we've worked with over the years uh, in the Murray and in GEDA groups at Penn uh, the ALU group at CUNY. Uh, you saw Nick Kartov, we collaborate uh, together now, um, as well as uh, the Gianola group who's at UC Santa Barbara. So I just thought I would start with a, um, just sort of giving a little bit of a perspective on what we uh, think about here in the sense that of using uh, nanocrystals. And today I'll focus, I said, on metal nanocrystals and thinking about how we can control uh, and take advantage of their physical properties. And I'll start to also interweave, of course, that the examples that we describe here can be more broadly applied to different compositions, sizes, and shapes of nanoparticles. And so I'll say that I'll just introduce a little flavor on, on the examples too of mixing metals with magnets. Uh, but of course, we also work on other compositions as well. And so we're very interested in thinking about how we can sort of tailor and couple uh, combinations of physical properties. And so the story I'm going to tell you about it, I can kind of sum, sum up uh, in, a, in a slide here, where I'm first going to talk about assemblies of nanoparticles and controlling the inner particle distance by controlling surface chemistry, and use that as a way to sort of design and tailor the optical properties. It also tailors the electrical properties of metal particle assemblies. Um, and then I'll also give some introductions to the opportunities to, of course, uh, do work like this. It could be um, so on this example here, these are supposed to represent metal particles. These are supposed to represent magnetic particles. You can mix them together. So instead of doing them and making these complex heterostructures in the synthetic pot, uh, Ray's better at that than I am. Uh, but we think about how do we use the building blocks that we can uh, synthesize and effectively homogenize and couple their physical properties on a much smaller length scale. So I'll talk about some examples where we mix metals and magnets. And then finally, I'll introduce you to an idea where we take advantage of the very different uh, chemical and mechanical properties, as well as thermal properties of, of nanocrystals and juxtaposing them against bulk thin films. And we really can use the surface of these nanoparticles as a way to address them. And so I'll introduce you to the idea of making these sort of heterostructures of nanocrystals and bulk thin films and also introduce you to some of their mechanical properties that allow us to create three-dimensional structures. And so I'll just show you as a cartoon, I'll talk uh, and introduce you to these ideas that we can trigger chemically and thermally these structures to fold in three dimensions up from a two-dimensional pattern structure and use that as a way to make chiral optical metamaterials. 
we can even go further and release these structures up into uh, solvents and sort of think about micron scale or, or submicron scale uh, superstructures and thinking about how to use their physical properties. So I'll start from the uh, beginning and sort of connect this to what we uh, know very well as we think about the examples of, of metal nanoparticles. They're really well known for their localized surface plasmon resonance, the idea that when you shine light, the uh, electrons in the metals, those free electrons will oscillate uh, back and forth with the electromagnetic field. Um, and that creates a dipole that we see uh, either in absorbance or for larger particles in scattering that you see uh, and are known as the localized surface plasmon resonance. And something that, uh, as Ray showed in, in the chemistry, right, you can tailor size and shape. He talked, showed a lot about spheres up to nanorods. And that's often used, for example, as a way to tune that resonance, uh, for example, in metal nanoparticles. And so we know, um, and of course, there are, uh, you know, well studied since the day of Faraday. They're well appreciated uh, for their optical characteristics and their color. Um, and they're also, of course, used uh, in particular for surface enhanced Raman scattering. But today what I wanna do is focus on the story of using these uh, particles as building blocks of materials. Um, and I won't talk about, but we've looked at what happens just as you think about atoms. What if we use these as the sort of next length scale of building block and start to build uh, for example, you know, molecules where you can start to add. So sometimes I think about these in relationships to things like organic molecules like coronines and hexabenzocoronines and so on. Um, and so you can sort of study how, what happens as you bring particles together and look at how their optical properties evolve. But what I wanna talk about today is not so much these small systems, but what happens when we control the distance between particles. In fact, it's one of the strongest handles we have uh, on them. And so I'll show you uh, today and talk about examples where most of the particles will be on the order of about five nanometers uh, in diameter. Um, and you can see that when we synthesize them in, in, uh, in uh, using wet chemical methods, they're capped, for example, in this example by oleal amine ligands. And if you look at just about a monolayer of these particles in, uh, in the transmission electron micrograph, you can see the particles uh, by the dark contrast as they block the electron beam. And of course, the organic ligand is all the white space that intervenes. And so what happens is that these, uh, these ligands create about a two nanometer separation between the surfaces of the particles. Um, and so if you look at them in DC resistivity, they're highly resistive materials. They have resistivities that are greater than 10 to the six ohm centimeters. And if you look at them in their optical characteristics, you'd say, well, there's some metal and there's some insulator that comes from the, from the molecules. And sort of on average, they still look like insulators even at optical frequencies. And so we look at that, if we look at and measure the dielectric function, which we do using spectroscopic ellipsometry, you can see that if this, uh, the real part of the dielectric function here is everywhere positive, and that's sort of characteristic of an insulator. And so if we think about wanting to use these uh, materials for their you know, functional properties in electronics or optics, often what we want to do is make something that's more conductive to allow electrons to be uh, delocalized over these systems. And so uh, the community has really uh, done a lot with what we refer to as ligand exchange, the idea that you can uh, replace the ligands that are on the surface of the particles with something new. And so today I'm going to focus on examples that are extremely simple where you can cast a film of these particles. This is an example uh, here. Um, and what we do is if you just dip it for a small amount of time in a solution of the new ligand, you can actually replace the, the parent ligand with the new ligand. And so this is, I'll show you, uh, we've done, I'll show you three examples to start with, where we start with the oleal amine ligands. You can, the nice thing is you can see in FTIR, the big carbon hydrogen uh, stretch. And if you follow, for example, we cast a film that was about hundred nanometers thick, if we replace it with a more a, uh, a shorter organic ligand, for example, well-known ethane uh, diethyl, right? You'll see that the CH stretch region has, has gotten a little smaller. And you'll also see that because that ligand is smaller, the particles get closer to, you'll see in a moment, closer together and the film compacts as well. And so you see that the film becomes thinner. And if you do that with even something smaller, in this example, it's thiocyanate, it's an inorganic uh, ion. And if you swap it, uh, for thiocyanate, you completely remove the organic ligands. And in fact, you can see the characteristic CN stretch here in IR spectroscopy of the, of the thiocyanate. 
And that brings the particles even closer. And you can see now the film is almost half as thick as it was before because we've removed or lost some of this organic volume. And you can see that laterally uh, as well. So that this is if, if we start with a monolayer of olelamine capped particles and replace it with ethane diethyl, you see that these particles get closer to one another. And of course, because it's only a monolayer, you start to see these and, and the volume is contracting. Of course, it has to end up someplace and you start to see this sort of available volume in uh, where there are no particles, right? That's simply becoming the whole system is contracting uh, together. But the interesting thing is that if you bring these particles closer together and ethane diethyl creates about a, a nanometer-ish uh, inner particle distance, the resistivity of films that are obviously thicker than a monolayer is what we use to measure uh, here, then you'll see that the resistivity drops by, you know, at about six orders of magnitude. And um, if you look uh, uh, at it, uh, in fact, I'll just mention beforehand that there's been a lot of literature on eth exchanging for ethane diethyl with people arguing that then this material is an insulator, it's a metal, it's on the cusp of a transition, probably depends exactly how much ligand you pull off in your, in your processing uh, from before. And the answer is yes, we would agree that it's, it's probably on the cusp of an insulator to metal transition. What hadn't been studied, what we were very interested in is actually in looking at its optical properties. And if you look here at its dielectric function, you just start to see in a very narrow spectral range that the real part of the dielectric function starts to dip negative. Something I'll also argue is consistent with this idea of traversing the insulator to metal transition. And finally, if we exchange with thiocyanate, of course, we lose more of that volume. Particles come closer together. Uh, some of them begin to fuse. You can also see that in diffraction studies where the, the uh, line uh, of uh, uh, characteristic gold, will, it'll narrow. Um, and so you can see that this is uh, on the left-hand side in a monolayer. You can see that the volume where there are no nanoparticles, of course, is getting bigger because the system's contracting. But if you were to make a dense film like we use for electrical or optical measurements, it would look something like the one here on, on the right, which looks like a metal film, but with lots of sort of empty uh, spaces. And so sometimes we refer to this as a diluted metal, right? There are fewer metal atoms actually, in fact, to contribute electrons to their electrical and optical properties. But in doing this, you can see that the DC resistivity drops even further. And from the parent system, we've, we, we've actually traversed about 10 orders of magnitude in resistivity. And in fact, for if we do this for gold, the films of gold are about a factor within a factor of 10 of a bulk evaporated film. We also do this with silver, it's about a factor of five. So you can really uh, make metals that are highly conductive akin to what you'd get from evaporating a material out of an evaporator. If you look at the uh, dielectric function, what you see now is that this, if you follow the real part of the dielectric function, it's everywhere negative. And that's characteristic of a true to metal. And the idea that by simple ligand exchange, which we carry out at room temperature, we can really take these insulating materials and make them into uh, highly conductive metals, both at DC and optical frequencies. And if we compare this to a film of evaporated gold, one thing that's nice about gold, in the case of gold, you see, you see that they start to fuse together, but they don't really form a dense uh, structure. And so what happens is that it, we can kind of dial in, and I'll say a little bit more about this shortly, we can dial in the dielectric function. So in this example here of the nanoparticles, the dielectric function is less negative than it would be from an evaporated gold film. And so the community working on optical metamaterials would really like to have the sort of flexibility to be able to sort of um, design more at will the dielectric function of materials. And so, uh, in fact, the idea of just using ligand exchange gives us one way to do that. And this is also explored just in using different compositions as well. In fact, about the time that we had uh, been working on this first, uh, there was work on other, looking at other uh, materials. In fact, one uh, example uh, from colleagues of ours at Purdue, uh, Sasha Boltaseva was working on titanium nitride, thinking about you know, how can we sort of open up the flexibility and therefore the devices that we could make um, if we could have different, uh, 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 different uh, dielectric functions of materials. Of course, these are all, you know, uh, CVD grown or physical, physically deposited uh, materials. But what you see uh, here is that our gold nanocrystal film doesn't look that different, it looks a little different than what we get from titanium nitride. And I'll show you that in fact, we have even greater freedom by controlling the surface chemistry to sort of more analog tune 
uh, the dielectric function of materials. So it really gives us a different way to think about not just you know, getting what we get off the periodic table from, from some of our materials. I'll um, also share with you the idea that one of the advantages of, of nanocrystalline materials is, of course, that they can be uh, dispersed in solvents, they can be handled like inks, and we can think about different ways to pattern these materials um, and think about integrating them in devices. And so in, when we first started working on this, we had uh, taken uh, substrates and um, uh, my uh, postdocs, Aaron Farferman and Sun Hoon Hong, had been working on this. And uh, Sun Hoon really came up with this process where we could use imprint lithography um, and you could imprint directly into a dispersion of the nanocrystals and create pattern structures uh, on the surface. And then you could just simply dip it in and do the ligand exchange and then convert each of those pattern features into the, into the metal. Um, and so you could see, and so each one of these pillars is in fact made up of many different nanocrystals. And with that, you could sort of use the complexity of lithography and create at the time we just, we had showed sort of simple structures of pillars with square and hexagonal motifs, lines and sort of nano hole arrays. And the idea that we could make these structures. And if you look at each one of these pillars, you know, you can see these, they're actually made up of many uh, nanocrystals. But this simple process actually gave us fairly high reproducibility over a large area in creating these pattern structures. And if we study these a little bit further, I'll just give you one more example uh, where you really see the impact of the surface chemistry. So if you were to take and pattern these structures and you still have that long ligand and you look at the uh, transmission, the transmission is sort of flipped upside down of your absorption or scattering and you see that it's at about 520 nanometers that with if it's even if you pattern a structure, the optical characteristics are still characteristic of the individual particles because they're not strongly coupled together when they have these longer ligands. Um, if we exchange with ethane dithyl, it shifts a little bit to the red. Um, and so the environment is changing, but still largely characteristic of, 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 a, material, of a system in which the particles are, are fairly well isolated from one another. But in the thiocyanate exchange, the, the uh, resonance really shifts to the red and it's characteristic of the geometry of the printed structure. And so we looked at this in playing with all sorts of different uh, geometries uh, to start with, um, but we can really think about how we would use this and started to work on using this as a technique to, to make different um, and large area printed optical metamaterials. So going a little further and I'll jump a little faster in, in, in time, is that we uh, were using imprint lithography. We could make more complex structures. We started working on rod-based structures. We could use these inks or dispersions of nanoparticles. We could spin coat them over large areas as well. In this case, we're using a resist to do the imprint instead of directly imprinting. Both processes work. Um, and then we could do the ligand exchange and convert these into metal structures. And so if we do that, then the resonance is gonna be characteristic of the printed geometry. And so we started by looking at uh, four representative uh, uh, shapes. So we looked at uh, circles and rods of varying different aspect ratio. And as you'd expect, if you look at the transmittance spectrum, that as we make the rods longer and longer and the electrons oscillating back and forth over larger and larger distances, just as you uh, might expect, is that this resonance then shifts to the red. And so of course, because they're also rods, this resonance is also uh, a longitudinal surface plasmon resonance, right? It really has a direction to it. And so it allows you to really control and gives you uh, an opportunity to play with polarized light. The idea that if, you know, if the lights polarize along this direction, you'll see the transmission uh, resonance here. But for, uh, you know, the, in the transverse direction, right, it would be someplace much further to the blue. And so what we did is to start thinking about what kinds of devices could you make? And so we worked with our colleagues in the ALU group and they designed a structure which consists of two sets of orthogonal rods. And the idea behind this is that we were interested in showing that we could make quarter wave plates. Now, if you think about a quarter wave plate, if you buy one from an optics company, it's, it's millimeters thick and it typically only operates over sort of a narrow spectral range. So in contrast, the materials that we're uh, printing, right, as I showed you before, these thicknesses of these films are on the order of 100 nanometers. So we're very interested in thinking about the opportunities for using these approaches, like people argue already, in um, metamaterials 
uh, for the area of integrated optics. And then here showing that using this processing technique, we could really uh, look to build large area structures and being able to do it more in parallel. So what we did is that we then said, uh, we looked at these uh, structures and the, uh, what you realize is that um, uh, we, we could make them and print them. You can see uh, an example here on the right. Uh, where each of these rods is now again made up of many nanocrystals where we've done this exchange process. Um, and what happens is that the rods that are in uh, the X direction are in fact slightly shorter than the rods in the Y direction. And so what happens is, is that if you look as you would expect is that the longer the rods, if this is from simulation, but if you look at the solid curve, the rods oriented in the X direction have a resonance at a shorter wavelength than the rods oriented in the Y direction, simply because we just change their, make one longer than the other. Um, but what you don't see so well in experiment, which is uh, great to, to see in simulation, is that if you look at the dashed lines, the dashed lines are looking at the phase of, of light as it interacts with the system. And so what happens is, is that if you look at between these two resonances, you see that you create a phase difference between the rods in the X and Y direction. And, that's a, um, and that phase difference, you can see that these are kind of parallel to each other. That phase difference is in fact 90 degrees. And that's what's required to, um, to uh, uh, control the polarization of light and convert uh, between circularly polarized light and linearly polarized light. And so what we did then was to uh, do an experiment where we, um, uh, we uh, cre uh, created linearly polarized light and you, we bought a commercial uh, uh, polarizer to create circularly polarized light. Now the challenge is that that commercial polarizer, of course, was millimeters thick. It cost $2,000. We waited two months to get it and it only operated over a narrow spectral range. Um, but it allowed us to do our experiment and show that if we send in circularly polarized light, if, we, if, it op if this surface that we fabricated operates as a quarter wave plate, then the light being transmitted should be linearly polarized. And so what we did is that then we could use a linearly, linear polarizer and analyze for how linearly polarized the transmitted light was. And so we measure something called the degree of linear polarization. It's basically just measuring how well did we do for the converting circularly polarized light into linearly polarized light. And we can see an experiment, we had uh, about at the maximum about 80% uh, success in, in converting to linearly polarized light. And the red uh, structure here is showing uh, what it would look like in simulation. Of course, our fabricated structures aren't always quite so perfect. These two are getting a little closer together. And so you can imagine that, you know, we were uh, relatively pleased with, um, you know, the opportunity for us to use these materials as a way to demonstrate polarizing surfaces. I'm going to skip the, that we went a little bit further um, and uh, tell you a little bit more of a story in thinking about how do we control uh, this uh, surface chemistry, but not just get ethane dithione and thiocyanate and sort of have just two different ways to tailor the dielectric function, but instead just control in a more analog way. If we take the olelamine cap particles and we immerse it in thiocyanate, you can get uh, and we just control it dilutely, we can just control the degree of ligand exchange. And as we do that, you can measure and see how much of the ligand old amine ligand comes off. We can see how the particles come together and start to uh, fuse. And we can just see, for example, how the resistivity, we can sort of dial in that resistivity. And the reason we were interested in this was actually not so much for the resistivity, but again, for their optical properties. And so if I just focus, for example, on the real and imaginary part of the dielectric function, you can see here that as you control the degree of the exchange, you start off with something that's an insulator. It starts to begin to dip negative, more negative, more negative, more negative, but you can really dial in all the way through from an insulator to the metal, the sort of um, the optical characteristics of, of these materials. And so why would you want to do that? What would be different about using nanoparticles and the opportunity to control their surface chemistry as opposed to a bulk metal? And so one example that we were interested in was the idea that, in fact, you could make very strong optical absorbers um, in contrast to what you could get from bulk gold. So if you look at bulk gold and you measure its extinction, of course, it does have extinction that picks up in the blue. And you know that there's an inner band transition in, in gold at short wavelengths. It's what gives it its color. Um, and so 
at, at short wavelengths, of course, you can get absorption in gold, but not really at, not at long wavelengths. And so what we're interested to see is that as we control the degree of exchange, just by controlling the time that we immersed it in the solution, we could control, of course, the, the, uh, the extinction of the material. And so what you can see is that, for, for example, for a short time of extinction, if you look at the example here at 808 nanometers, you can see there's actually a fairly large extinction here in the nanocrystal film, something that you don't get in the bulk material. And so what you can see, we actually uh, would shine a, a, a little laser pointer operating at, uh, uh, we did both 447 and 808. At, eight, at 447, you know, all the metals absorb. And so they would all, if you shine light, it would heat up and you could measure the increase in temperature. Uh, that's not true, obviously, for bare glass, right, that you'd expect to be transparent. Um, but if you did it at 808 nanometers, you would see that your bulk metal film wouldn't absorb that light, right, it doesn't have extinction there. And so you don't see a rise in temperature. But by dialing in the ligand exchange and controlling how much, you could actually make and convert that optical energy into thermal energy and see even with a little uh, handheld laser pointer get things like 20 degrees increases in temperature. So for uh, a demonstration, we uh, actually layered on top of this nanocrystal film, a thermochromic pigment. And you can see that wherever we shine the light and obviously generated heat at 808 nanometers in the metal film, that the thermochromic polymer then on top would then change color in response. And so there are examples where we'd like to be able to make from an, an application space of an optics to make strong optical absorbers. And so again, using nanocrystals give us a way to access and design very thin optical absorbers and to have them operate at wavelengths that we might not have for, for example, for other materials. So again, I'll just sort of add in a little bit of complexity, building on the same kinds of ideas of using uh, imprint lithography. We also combine, for example, gold particles with zinc ferrite. Now zinc ferrite's a, a magnetic material. At the size that we use them, they're super paramagnetic. So they're not yet big enough to be ferromagnetic, but it means that they have a, a high magnetic saturation, but no coercivity. And I'll show you that in a second. And so what we did is if you mix them together, we could then make structures or these you know, rod shaped, we sometimes refer to them as superstructures, but where they're combinations of both metals and magnets. And so we could make them, this is an example where we did the imprint lithography, we could harvest them from the, uh, from the surface suspend them in solvent. This is when we drop them back down. You can see sort of the rods and that kind of, you can see some graininess characteristic of the nanocrystals in the material. And we can do that same kind of ligand exchange. And so what we did is that we found that if we do that ligand exchange, the magnetic materials, they're oxide materials, they don't like to, to fuse in the same way. And so even after that process in these rods, you see in their magnetic characteristics that you see a nice you know, uh, a, a tall hysteresis loop, right? The idea that there's a, a large magnetic saturation, this one's normalized, but you can see that there's no coercivity. So that means that when we wanted to, you can even tell because if we take these uh, structures and we suspend them and then we put them down on the surface, if they were ferromagnetic, you would know that they would chain, right? In a, like, like you uh, would with magnets if you were playing with them. But because they're super paramagnetic, they won't orient unless we apply an external magnetic field. And so we wanted to be able to have that control, which I'll show you in just a second. These rods also still have an optical resonance. You can see it here. Um, and it just depends on how many magnetic particles we put into the system. So as we add magnetic material, it reduces the amount of gold atoms that contribute electrons to the resonance. And it can ultimately block the path of the electrons sloshing back and forth across the rods. And so we wanted to put in as many magnetic particles as we could to give them magnetic character, but not too much that we lose the resonance that we would see optically. So we ended up with a sort of three to one ratio of gold to zinc ferrite. But I'll give you an example of what we did was that we took these rods and we suspended them in a solvent. And then what we did is that we could shine a polarized light and if the light was polarized along the length of rod at its resonance, then the light would be rejected, right? It wouldn't transmit through the, uh, through the suspension. But what we could do is we could take a magnet and we could, ro by if we rotate, rotated the magnet, the rods would change their orientation in the suspension. And so if they change their orientation, so now that the light that's polarized 
is in an orthogonal direction, then the light's transmitted. And so you can think about, as you start to thinking about um, materials, we started to think about ideas of smart windows, that if you, you could take out, uh, these, these structures and you could simply use magnetic fields to, to basically control whether light passes or light's transmitted uh, through the material. So just to, that was sort of our first foray in, in thinking about really mixing together different uh, materials and their properties. So I wanna introduce you to one other idea that's I'll sort of take through towards the end of the presentation, which is the idea that what else is different about nanocrystals? So, you know, we spend a lot of time as a community thinking about their differences in their electronic properties and their optical properties but also their differences in their uh, chemical properties and their um, you know, thermal properties and mechanical properties. And so what we did here is again, we used imprint lithography, but we first deposited a thin film of metal. In the first examples, we used titanium. Later, I'll show you examples where we just used bulk gold. Um, and then we deposited on top by spin coating a, a film of these nanoparticles. And so you could make a bilayer, right? Where nanoparticles were sitting on a metal film. And you can see here, there's a thin layer of titanium here, and this is the uh, thicker gold layer of, uh, of the nanoparticles. But as I introduced to you at the very start is that we can change the surface chemistry. And so if we introduce and immerse this structure in thiocyanate, as I showed you before, all the particles wanna come closer together, right? They wanna compress both laterally and, and, and vertically. And what happens is, is that as these structures wanna pull, they're pulling together on this top surface. And if we free the bottom from the surface, then the whole structure wants to bend, right? We create a large, um, uh, we create compression here that creates misfit strain here at this interface between the nanoparticles and the metal. And the structures then fold, start to fold in three dimensions. And you can see that here, right? Here's the titanium on the outside and the gold here on, on the inside. And so when we saw that we could do this, then, of course, you know, we, uh, we turned on our hats to say, well, what could we do? Um, and we wanted to start to understand um, their mechanical properties a little for us. That was something new, but also to think about how we could develop design rules to control sort of with greater freedom. How do we control the bending of these structures? And so I'll only briefly go into this in the interest of time. But what we did is that we controlled, for example, uh, the thickness of the titanium layer in comparison to the thickness of the of the nanocrystal layer, and we would measure how much it bent by looking at their, um, uh, the, the uh, curvature of the materials in the electron microscope. And so uh, this equation looks crazy, I understand that, but actually this is an equation that describes um, the thickness of the bilayer structure in comparison to the radius of curvature. And the rest of this function only, it looks very busy, but it only has two uh, sets of parameters. One is K, which is the ratio of the Young's modulus, which is a measure of its mechanical properties of the nanocrystal film, something that we didn't know in comparison to that of bulk titanium, which we do know, right? You can look that up in a table, it's a materials property. And then the T is the ratio of the thicknesses, which we could measure. So what we did is that we, if you see here is that as we made thinner and thinner uh, layers on bottom of titanium, the structures would curl more and more. Um, and what it gave us a way to do, we could measure lots of these structures and start to build up statistics. And it gave us two very interesting uh, measures. One is, is that we could measure the strain, how much misfit strain was being created once these particles wanted to come together through this uh, sort of compressive force. And so the strain is about 6.4% in our measurement. And just to sort of give you an example, that this is a factor of 10 times larger than you get by heating a copper uh, steel bimetallic strip uh, by a thousand degrees, by changing it by a thousand degrees. And that's just simply through this simple immersion process of, uh, in, a, in a chemical solution. So it, it does, a, it, we, we create a, lot, a large misfit strain that really drives this folding. And the other thing is that we learned about what the Young's modulus is of these materials. And what you'll see is that uh, it's under a gigapascal, in fact, it's about 100 times smaller than that of bulk gold, which is about 79 gigapascals. And so what you can see is that they also make these structures, um, these you know, assemblies of particles is softer, really allowing us to get this sort of folding behavior of the materials. I wanna say we also looked at the width and we understood that as we made structures wider, partly because of our fabrication process, 
then we wouldn't see the same bending. So it gave us a set of design rules, and I'll just give you some examples of what we uh, work to do. So we could pattern by lithography all sorts of structures in two dimensions. So here's an example of an, a, a, an L that has a skinny long arm and a thicker uh, foot. Um, we can make many of them. And what happens is, is that when we do this process of this ligand exchange and we release them from the surface, what happens is that the, the, the foot would stay rigid and the skinny arm would fold. Now, of course, when we put them on a substrate to image them, everything sticks to the substrate. But if you were to look at them in, their, uh, in a solvent in an optical microscope and just watched as they tumbled in the solvent, you could really see that they have a, a three-dimensional shape that starts to form. And then we played on that idea. If we made plus steins and the arms bent, we get things that look like claws. We could make this sort of zigzag structure and they would start to form helices. So we really started to understand uh, what kinds of structures we could create by using this approach. Um, we could also do this with magnetic materials, just to give you a sense that this is broadly uh, uh, possible. Uh, this is a structure here where we made a claw and then we came with a magnet, magnet, and as we rotated the magnet, the structure would change in response to the magnetic field and we could drive its orientation as it was suspended in the solvent. It's a little bit easier to see it here and uh, 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 as a handful of snapshots uh, that we took. Um, and the reason is, is that, by, uh, um, that we studied uh, and, and modeled is that in this sort of curved structure, there's sort of one low energy axis. And what that means is that as you control the magnetic field, kind of as it bisects the arms, as we control the magnetic field, we're actually turning the whole claw structure. And so it gives you a way from, from outside to think about how do you control the motion of these suspended structures? Um, and so you can really start to think about how we use these and use external stimuli um, and even think about these for sort of ideas in active matter. So then I'm going to show you finally bringing it back to the idea and a target that we were really interested in is that if you could really make three dimensional structures, you could think about how do you address a problem that's not so easy, not impossible, but if you look at examples of chiral materials, you have to make them three dimensional. And conventionally by fabrication, people will do a sort of sequential patterning and deposition, patterning and deposition to sort of build up many layers. Um, and often it involves using e-beam lithography and it's hard to do. Uh, it's very timely, it's costly. Um, and often therefore it also gets restricted to fairly small areas. And then there are some examples where people have been doing direct write, but it's also a very serial process. And so you can see beautiful structures, but again, typically only over sort of tens of micron kind of scales. And so we were interested to see that we could, um, you know, fabricate sort of large area templates. We could use this process of imprint lithography and then we could um, deposit metal on the bottom. We could deposit nanocrystals, make these bilayer structures, and then we could exchange their surface and get them to fold in three dimension. And what we learned a little bit more is we could get them to fold in three dimension, and then we could further control that even by thermal annealing, we'll get them to fold even more. And so it gave us a way by using that one simple uh, uh, patterning step that we could create these three-dimensional uh, surfaces to make chiral metamaterials. Um, and so I'll just give you a, a sense that, you know, again, just like if we do the ligand exchange, we bring these particles closer together. The one thing that happens if you, again, further anneal this, what happens is that these grains really grow to form polycrystalline uh, materials. And so if you subsequently further anneal uh, these materials, you'll get greater, um, fusion, and it doesn't change the optical properties very much if you look at the real and imaginary part of the dielectric function. It stops evolving quite as much, but it creates much greater misfit strain. And so you can see that here that as you anneal a, uh, a structure, this, uh, you can see that you can control how much the arms would curve. So I'm going to go on to focus uh, just for the interest of time on some of the uh, moving on to this ideal of making chiral systems. And in that case, in chiral systems, we want to make structures that are either uh, left and right-handed, right, just so that they have, right, that that's uh, that that you don't can't superimpose their mirror images. Um, and so you can see we made structures with of different lengths of arms, and you can see examples of them before we anneal the structure, and then after we anneal. So all of these were done with the ligand exchange, and then uh, and they're released. Um, and what we take advantage of here is that when we um, 
when we release the arms, we're using an etching process to get underneath, but it won't get underneath this middle pad. Uh, it's too big. And so we can release the arms, but still keep them bound to the surface if we want to. Um, and so we could, again, I won't go through, we could do, do all sorts of measurements mechanically um, to show that we could really build up. I won't go through the details of the model uh, in the interest of time, but you can see that again, we can get very large, the same kind of six and a half percent strain by this ligand exchange. And then when we anneal it, we can even double that strain and really get the structures to bend uh, even further as you can see here uh, in the examples before and after annealing. But what could, could you do with this? Um, maybe I'll, fo I'll focus now on the examples of thinking about the sort of two enantiomers and making chiral materials. So what we do is that we pattern these structures that I think of looking like pinwheels in two dimensions, as you see uh, uh, examples here um, on the left and here on the right. Um, and then we could do this over very large areas. And so you're seeing examples here of some of the large area structures for the two different enantiomers that we can make by these fabrication processes. And if we further anneal the structures, we can get them to bend and kind of even further. Um, and you can see uh, these sort of three-dimensional structures that are bound to the surface uh, here in these uh, electron micrographs. So what makes it interesting, what happens in, in a chiral material is that if you, again, if you send in circularly polarized light, if it has the same handedness of its rotation uh, that the arms do with the orientation of the handedness of the light, then the light that is transmitted will be blocked. It'll be reduced because it interacts with uh, the material here on the surface. If on the other hand, uh, the structures here on the surface have the opposite handedness from that of the light, then the light would be transmitted and it wouldn't block very much of the light. And so often what people do in looking at uh, chiral systems is to really look at the difference in the transmission of light between the two different polarizations of light, left-hand polarized light and right-hand polarized light. And it gives you a measure of just the, 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 um, the ability for these chiral structures, right, that handedness to really control that transmitted light. So what you can see here is that we made these two different enantiomers. And what you can see is that um, as you have these uh, structures on a surface, these two are opposite, uh, but similar in size, but opposite in handedness. And so if you look at the difference in transmission between right and left hand circuit polarized light, they have very similar magnitudes. I'll focus on the ones after annealing in black and in red. Um, and there are very similar energies because they have the same lengths of arms, but they're opposite in their sign. And that's just simply a measure of the fact that there are two different enantiomers. I'm gonna uh, skip uh, the simulations for a moment, work we did in, in uh, uh, collaboration with Nick. I'll just sort of start to share with you what else could you do, right? If you think about using these materials as a way to build uh, uh, different kinds of devices, some things that have been, uh, you know, are, are different, not always so easy to achieve. So an example here is that we set, made two sets of arms four with one length that were longer that are shown in red and pointing uh, you know, in the, in, uh, toward, toward your right, and four that are shorter but pointing in the opposite direction uh, toward your left. And what you'd expect then is that the uh, shorter ones that would be at higher energy or, or a larger wave number uh, than the ones that were red, and they would have opposite uh, signs of their difference in transmission between right and, and, and left-hand circularly polarized light. So the red uh, arms would give um, a lower wave number uh, positive, for example, uh, uh, difference in transmission, and the shorter ones would give you a, um, a higher wave number, but also a, uh, a uh, negative sign in the transmission. Um, and so that's what we see. We can sort of create positive and negative changes in transmission at different spectral ranges. And what we showed is that if you take these structures and you anneal them, they'll bend further. And as they bend further, their resonances uh, shift to higher energies. And that's because as we do that, these, uh, we see just in part from curvature and also because they become a little bit more metallic as they fuse, that what will happen is that each of these will shift to the red and you get a region for which you originally had a negative response in the delta T for which you now have a positive response. And so that's what you see here. As an example, it's not yet reconfigurable. It's something we're very interested in, but it's one where you could really show that you could sort of configure a system to change um, and change its transmission uh, in, in terms of its, its, its sign. 
And then we also showed, for example, you could uh, make many arms. Uh, you could pattern uh, of different lengths and they would each contribute to their resonances at different energies. And you could make these sort of starting to work to make broader band uh, um, uh, chiral materials. And so that we were trying to sort of widen the spectral range here over which it operates. And this is just showing you how, you know, we could make these over large areas using this fabrication process. And so I'll finally just finish with this example here, which is to say that we also discovered that in addition uh, to thinking about adding lots of arms to broaden the response, you also get the benefit of them as you bring them closer together, they start to couple to one another and you can actually further broaden their response. So this is an example where the structures each have four arms, but they're further apart. And so you get one resonance that's characteristic of the length of the arms that you have. If you were to take, even though there's still four arms, but you bring these structures closer together, what uh, was shown by the Katov group in simulation in our collaboration is that neighboring arms start to interact with one another. And when they get close enough, then you start to see that you get a splitting that is characteristic like you see in hybridization of, of molecules and other materials. You would start to see a splitting into two resonances. And if we really wanted to make a broadband surface, what we did is that we combined systems where we put lots of different arms. So you can see there are 12 arms. There are actually four sets um, of, three, uh, of three, where four, each of the four sets have different lengths. And so that adds to the breadth of the response. And then we bring them close together. And so we get a large and fairly broad uh, chiral response. So it gives you a way of thinking about how do we use these materials um, and what makes them different in fabrication uh, and thinking about designing optical metamaterials. So with that, I'll sort of just finish with a conclusion and hope that I've got to share with you today a little bit of the story about what's different or special about using nanocrystal materials, the opportunity to really address their surfaces uh, through, uh, through surface chemistry, to really transverse that, traverse that dielectric to metal transition, to think about tailoring the materials just by ligand chemistries to be anywhere from being strong optical absorbers to strong scatters that we then use, for example, in making things like quarter wave plates. You can sort of think about the opportunity to mix and match different materials. Again, the idea of heterostructures, but from very different classes of materials to think about the opportunity of, of bringing together and, and realizing different phenomena. For example, I showed you by mixing metals and magnets, the idea you can create sort of magnetically switchable optical uh, responses. And then even further thinking about their different chemical, mechanical, and thermal properties, to thinking about creating foldable and 3D structures um, as a way to design, as, as, I, as I finished with in the example of optical metamaterials. Um, so with that, I'll stop and I'll certainly be happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you for your wonderful talk. <laughs> so let me read you uh, the first question. Uh, thank you for a wonderful pre presentation, Professor Kagan. In your uh, uh, presentation, uh, the uh, nanoparticle sphere were used uh, presumably due to their relatively easy overproduction. Have you also explored shape controlled nanocrystals, especially the like, uh, likes of cubes, octahedral? Etc. that have more efficient packing and various other plasmonic modes compared to spear? So we do, and we have worked with some of the other um, uh, sh uh, shapes. We've worked with rods. We've also worked with cubes, like uh, has like, uh, uh, been suggested. Um, uh, and so uh, the answer is, is yes, uh, we have. We have um, done it a little bit more to understand the interactions for small numbers of particles than, than using it yet. Um, for for making these sort of larger films of materials, but I agree with you um, that they do have better packing. We've actually done that for semiconductors and transport, where you create better interfacial areas. So I certainly appreciate the uh, the question. We've used it a little bit less in these examples here for making these sort of large area surfaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the next question. Okay, I have two questions. So you can tune transmittance of a gold particle by ligands. First question, how long does it take to change ligand? Second, what is the reason for the absorption peak shift, the nature of ligand or distance among of gold nanoparticles or both? 
So the example that I showed you, in fact, we uh, had made a movie of it, um, but that uh, that exchange takes about 30 seconds. So you, it's usually we can um, at high concentrations. So, you know, usually on the order of 30 seconds to a minute or two minutes, uh, you can tailor concentration and control time as a way to control the degree of exchange, but it's usually very quick. Um, and then uh, um, when you asked about the change in optical characteristics, so uh, in part, when the particles are still far apart uh, from one another, uh, some of the uh, sort of subtle changes like you see for ethane diethyl is largely a change in the environment, right? That the particle is now seeing a different dielectric environment and that would be the dominant effect. But by the time we really exchange it, what we're seeing is that the electrons really, it now looks like a bigger structure, hmm. right? The electrons are now really uh, sloshing back and forth across multiple particles. And then the optical response, of course, is, is one where... Hmm. If you really make it into a, effectively a large metal, you'll lose the resonance in a large film uh, unless you pattern the structure and create, you know, some localization, some barriers on a different length scale. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your wonderful talk, even in the late night. Late night. <laughs> so anyway, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much.